Now starting, all attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon and good morning to everybody. This is Lauren Wenzel. I'm with the National Marine Protected Areas Center, and we're really pleased uh, to welcome you to the monthly MPA webinar series. Uh, and also want to thank our partners, EBM Tools Network and Open Channels. Uh, we've got a really interesting topic for you today. The title of our talk is Solving the Mystery of Marine Protected Area Performance linking governance, conservation, ecosystem services, and human well-being. And um, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our speakers. We have uh, Dr. Helen Fox, who is the Senior Director of Research and Monitoring at RARE, and who leads ongoing development of monitoring and evaluation to help ensure that RARE designs and executes conservation projects with clear and measurable outcomes in behavior change and threat reduction. And before joining RARE, Helen was the Director of Marine Science at World Wildlife Fund and provided scientific and technical leadership in support to marine places where WWF works, with a particular focus on Indonesia and the Coral Triangle. And she has worked as a naturalist and a snorkel and dive guide and conducted marine conservation research projects in many parts of the world, including Indonesia, Australia, Belize, the Solomon Islands, and the US. And our other speaker today is David Gill, who is a postdoctoral fellow. Uh, at Succinct, and his research focuses on identifying linkages between marine protected area governance, human well-being, and ecosystem health. And this project brings together an interdisciplinary team of researchers and data from MPAs from around the world to identify key trends between MPAs and their social and ecological impacts. And David has recently completed his PhD, congratulations, uh, and it's entitled The Economic Value of Reef Fishes to the Fishing and Dive Tourism Industries in the Caribbean. So in a moment, I'm going to turn the, uh, the microphone over to our speakers, but I just wanted to mention that we do uh, spend a good chunk of time at the end for questions and discussion, and we really encourage you to submit your questions and comments, and you can do that via the question box on the, on the webinar interface. So please go ahead and type those in. You don't need to wait till the end to do that, but we will go ahead when the presentation is over and then facilitate that question and answer session. So, Helen, I'm happy to turn it over to you. Thanks. All right, great. Well, thanks very much, Lauren. Uh, and I also want to acknowledge uh, Noah, who played a key role very early on in this. Uh, Mike, Masha, and I came over to Noah and talked about uh, what was the potential for looking at data from How Is Your MPA Doing, which was an effort uh, a number of years ago from NOAA. And also Susie Holst has been a member of this working group as, and has been hugely helpful in getting the, the data that NOAA has been collecting into this project. So I wanted to say that right at the very beginning uh, with much gratitude. Uh, and this uh, represents a collaboration between the National Socio-Environmental Synthesis Center, which is the SINC, and the Luke Hoffman Institute of WBF International. So they've, they've co-funded this work uh, and a long list of partners. Sorry, we're not... Have you given us control to be able to... There we go. Okay. Uh, uh, partners and participants in the working group uh, who have done this and also want to very uh, gratefully acknowledge our data providers who, who shared this and made this global synthesis possible. And so what is the mystery of marine protected area performance that we're seeking to solve? Uh, the question is, why are some marine protected areas seeming to be win-win, both for the environment and the human communities that depend on them, and why in others do there seem to be a trade-off situation? And so what we wanted to try to do was do uh, a global analysis to try to answer that question. We know that billions of people around the world rely on marine resources for food or income, uh, and we also know that the health of many marine ecosystems is being severely compromised by human activities. Those in developing countries uh, who most depend on these resources are bearing the brunt of these impacts. So, in response, there have been investments of millions, if not billions of dollars, in place-based conservation initiatives. Uh, for example, the GEF, the Global Environment Facility, uh, has provided more than $2.3 billion to fund protected areas over the last 20 years. Uh, not all of these are marine, uh, but they have supported the management of over 1,000 MPAs. 
And we also have globally, internationally agreed on targets for global coverage. So for example, the Convention on Biological Diversity, the CBD, uh, the 193 signatories of that have all pledged to Aichi target number 11, which says that we'll get 10% of coastal and marine areas uh, protected by 2020. So as a result of these investments and these targets, there's been a rapid increase in MPA coverage over the last 20 decades. And so this figure shows over those last 20 years, the, the blinking on the, the increased coverage of the blue areas representing protected area the state. And so now we are actually a, a third of the way there with 3.4% of the, the ocean surface in marine protected areas. Uh, the por proportion of this that is in no-take zones is much smaller. It's only about 0.6%, uh, but still we're, we're on our way. And as we go towards that 10% target by 2020, uh, and also given what's at stake, we want to know how can we better ensure that MPAs deliver on the ecological and social benefits that they were intended to produce. What can we learn from this 3% if they're effective at meeting their objectives, and why or why not? And so this is our uh, big question, asking what drives uh, MPAs globally. Uh, and so we're looking at three main questions between governance and ecological outcomes. Uh, the first, uh, governance has been theorized to be a major factor affecting the success of management interventions such as MPAs, where how decisions are made and how resource use rights are defined, allocated, and enforced can affect social and ecological outcomes. So we want to know how are MPAs governed and then we also want to know what is the fish response to those outcomes. Uh, certainly a lot of work has been done on examining the biophysical and MPA characteristics that affect the biological performance in MPAs, uh, notably work done by Sarah Lester et al., who's part of our working group, uh, Graham Edgar with the, the Reef Life Survey, uh, et cetera. And then our third major question is, what is the relationship between MPA governance and that response? So can we actually look at the, uh, you know, the connections between those two? And so uh, to do this, uh, we used an approach, a combination of three main research frameworks. So first, we define MPAs as social ecological systems, and we use Eleanor Ostrom's uh, SES, Social Ecological Systems Framework, to identify what are the components of this system and the relationships between them. This framework, however, doesn't include an experimental procedure, and so we used uh, impact evaluation, uh, Sansu Ferraro et al., to isolate the effects of MPAs as a policy intervention while controlling for other factors. So David will get into a little more detail on that later. And then finally, uh, to test the governance to outcomes relationships, we'll use hypotheses from common pool resource theory, uh, also coming in large part from the late great uh, Eleanor Ostrom, uh, to test the uh, expected relationships between how resources are governed and their sustainability. And so uh, one of the, the products that will be forthcoming from this working group is a, a conceptual manuscript that sort of ties these frameworks together. And uh, Mike Masha is lead on that with, again, contributions from many. And so this list here uh, talks about what are the governance design principles uh, that have been identified that are likely to lead to successful or sustainable uh, social and ecological outcomes. So you can see it's a fairly long list. I'll give you a minute to look at those. And then, the, uh, <laughs> as is often the case with goals for global synthesis, uh, we were only actually able to get data on a subset of, of these. And so the specific indicators that we were able to get data on uh, for resource and user boundaries include clearly defined boundaries, uh, the legal status, and whether there were uh, regulations clearly in support of management, 
For collective choice arrangements, we looked at uh, stakeholder participation in decision making and whether the management was state, shared, or non-state management. And for user and resource monitoring, uh, whether there was adequate uh, capacity to do enforcement and whether monitoring data was actually used for management. So that's a little bit of the setup, and now I'm going to turn it over to, oh, whoops, sorry, I just forgot to say the uh, actual, um, most of our data came from this management effectiveness tracking tool, also called the MET, um, that uh, basically IUCN and WCMC funded by the Jeff and led by Lauren Code have been doing a Herculean effort to consolidate the thousands of MET assessments that have been done around the world, but there was no system, there was no framework to track it and pull it together. So that's been a really huge effort and um, we've benefited from it greatly. And the other major source for our governance data was NOAA's MPA management checklist. And so Susie Holst and David did a crosswalk with this and the, the indicators and said, okay, if this is what it is in the MET, this is what it is in NOAA management checklist. And so that was really helpful for extending out our data set. So there's the setup. And now I'm going to transfer it over to David. We're actually talking about results. Yes. Okay. So where are we so far? Um, in looking at the data, as Helen said, coming from the MET, coming from the NOAA, uh, checklist as well as some scorecard, MPA scorecards that were done in Indonesia, um, we were able to identify just over 390 MPAs around the world. And that's where you see the blue dots on the map. And so of these, 83% um, of them were state managed and 82% of them were legally gazetted. However, only 29% had clearly defined boundaries um, regarding the MPA and zones and only 20% had regulations defined and set out in place that support MPA management. Um, just around half of them said that stakeholders, local community members, directly contribute to the decision-making process. And around 47% said that they had acceptable or excellent enforcement or enforcement capacity. Nevertheless, only 16% of MPAs stated that they the monitoring data that they collect, whether it be ecological, social, or management monitoring, only 16% stated that that information then gets translated back into management and for management decisions. Okay, so what about the fish? Uh, and as um, Helen had mentioned, uh, we had many data contributors to, to help us with this process. We initially started with Sarah Lester's uh, review of marine protected area outcomes, uh, which give us information on about 124 MPAs globally. And through her meta-analysis, we had quite a few data points. However, we still did not have enough to, to continue with the analysis. And so with the generous help of many of the other data uh, providers and data repositories on data holders, uh, for example, the Atlantic Gulf Rapid Reef Assessment in the Caribbean, that's the orange dots, on the work that's done in the Bird's Head Seascape by WWF and others in green, um, NOAA's uh, data uh, coral reef monitoring programs, both in the U.S., Caribbean, and Pacific, as well as um, Graham Edgar's Reef Life Surveys, uh, which were done around the world. And so by Looking at by compiling these data, uh, we came up with a total of 15, over 15,000 sampling events in, or, in just around 250 MPAs. And so this is a really valuable data set, and again, thanks to all of our data contributors. And so with these data, um, although we do have quite a few points, there are very few time series in place. Uh, and especially when we are looking at baseline data, so if we make, uh, reef surveys that were done before the MPA was established. And so um, for our metric, how we will measure MPA outcomes, we are developing response ratios, which is looking at the ratio of biomass inside to outside of the MPA. And so this is similar to the response ratios uh, done by uh, Sarah Lester and others in their studies. And so we do recognize that without the baseline, without baseline data and relying on inside and outside comparisons, there is a likelihood to come up 
um, come upon many confounding factors. And so, um, just given this cartoon example, uh, we, although the fish population on the left is outside and the fish population on the right is inside a marine protected area, that's the white box, um, it is likely that there are other factors that could account for differences between these two fish populations, one being close to shore, near a specific habitat, the other being further offshore. And so, in order to do um, a proper analysis to, to identify and isolate the effects of MPAs as, as, an, um, as an intervention or rather and not to um, get confounded by these other factors, we would want to ensure that we are comparing apples to apples and oranges to oranges. And so to do this, we're using a process called statistical matching. And this is used where in, in many other disciplines where uh, baseline data are unavailable or it is unethical to collect baseline data. And so basically we use the same factors that could um, account for con the same confounding factors that could um, that could be that come up in the analysis. We use those to develop match pairs. And so for example in this case we want to ensure that we know that distance from shore or distance um, or distance from a specific habitat is an important um, factor in variation of fish populations. And so um, this is why we want to ensure that we match population A to A and B with B. And so with our knowledge of social, biophysical, and other factors that affect fish populations, we um, match for more 15,000 sites. We develop match pairs of inside and outside sites based on um, some of these variables here and a few others. And through this technique, we came up uh, we, we about 20% of our outside sites were not be able to be used because um, there were inappropriate matches. But um, through this, we were still able to um, to keep gather over eight, I think I believe around um, 6,000 matched pairs of sites inside and outside MPAs around the world. Okay, and so what does that these translate into? So the map shows the uh, the response ratios, the ratio of inside to outside, averaged by MPAs, and so this represents 216 MPAs around the world. And because the response ratio is in the ratio of inside to outside, positive values indicate um, those areas where the fish biomass were greater inside of the MPA than outside, and negative um, values indicate the opposite. And so the green, the yellow, and the orange um, icons, uh, symbols, those indicate MPAs that had um, positive response ratios. And these four colors represent the quartiles of the, uh, the average response ratios that we have. And so overall, um, looking at the map either by individual MPAs or say average by eco regions, we see quite diverse re results, but overall positive. If uh, three of the four quartiles based uh, or around 74% of the data um, showing MPAs that have positive response ratios uh, from around the world. Okay, and so pulling it all together, looking at the relationship between the MPA governance and the and those fish response or outcome variables. Uh, at the simplest level, when looking at how we govern MPAs, it's, uh, we speak about resource use rights and what rights and uses are allowed within the protected area. And one of the most common ones that are, speak are, that are looked at is looking, comparing no-take zones to areas where fishing are allowed in MPAs. And again, uh, with response ratios, positive values indicating um, greater biomass inside to the outside. We see um, comparing the fishing zone, that's the bar on the left, and those in no-take zones, the bar on the right. We see greater response ratios in no-take portions of MPAs around the world, as expected, as found in many other studies. But what we also see here is that even those areas in MPAs where fishing is allowed, we still have on average positive effects. And so even though some extractive use is going on, uh, these protected areas are still um, allowing for some positive ecological outcomes. And looking more closely at those the governance variables that Helen introduced uh, and the, the various 
attributes of the MPAs and in terms of how governance is carried out or the structures that are in place. Um, here we have on this spider we have um, the evolution uh, where one is where we have the evolution from state all the way through to non-state actors which is three. Um, we have inclusive decision making um, whether the MPA was is legally gazetted uh, regulation, if they had regulations in place that was supportive of MPA management, if the boundaries of the MPA was clearly defined, if there was active enforcement within the MPA and whether or not monitoring data, monitoring was conducted and that information was leading uh, to an informing management. And so um, when I, we plot those MPAs that had negative response ratios, and so these were about 48 of the 58 MPAs where we had both governance and ecological data. Um, those MPAs were all... Ten. ten. Uh, sorry, yeah, sorry, those are <laughs> ten, sorry. <laughs> um, so all of those MPAs were state-managed um, and they were they gave very strong scores for inclusive decision-making um, and they were almost all legally gazetted. They, however, had very um, weak scores for regulations and monitoring and on just around average scores for enforcement and boundaries. And so overlaying those MPAs where we saw positive response ratios, this is 48 of the 58 MPAs, um, you see that that population was made up mostly more of MPAs that were where management was devolved to non-state actors and as well those MPAs had significantly stronger, um, higher scores for regulations that are supportive of management. And, um, and again, although these are preliminary results, we are, we do, but there are potential uh, variables that we need to look at more closely for the ongoing analysis that could explain the differences in um, the, within those MPAs that are, have those positive um, outcomes and those that don't. Okay. All right, so I'm uh, now going to talk a little bit more about our just our next steps and uh, conclusions. As David mentioned, uh, these analyses are preliminary uh, and we're uh, working on more complete analytical models. That's just a little image of a, a small smattering of all the various things that uh, David is trying, and so he'll be happy to talk about that more. Uh, most of it's well over my head <laughs> uh, after that. Um, and we're also going to try to source additional data where we can, ecological data where we have management assessments and vice versa. So one of the you know, things I've, I hope came clear in the presentation is just the effort, the level of effort this was, uh, scouring the globe and various uh, you know, folks who have done these similar efforts to try to pull together data sets. And so it is really I think a globally unique compilation both of the governance data, nearly 400 MPAs, and of the ecological data, 250 MPAs, and yet when we put it together to see where do we have data on both, it's currently only 58, so less than 60. So that really sort of hinders our ability to be able to make the links between the two. And so we'll do some um, you know, digging to see can we get those numbers up because then there are potential you know, more analyses and more insights that, that could emerge. Including, if the data allow, we'd like to look at what governance factors are important under a variety of contexts. So for example, large versus small MPAs, nearshore versus offshore MPAs, um, et cetera. And so some of the uh, insights that have emerged from these preliminary results uh, with governance, the indicators from the management effectiveness data give us some insight into the governance conditions of MPAs around the world and uh, highlight that there are indeed significant room for improvement with some of the governance practices in MPAs. Uh, for example, having monitoring, uh, informing management, uh, etc. And so funding agencies and managers uh, can focus on building capacity within these specific areas of weaknesses uh, around, for example, more inclusive decision making, uh, things like that. For ecological outcomes, uh, again, our work 
largely extends existing work that has found fish response to protection tends to be highly diverse and in general it is uh, positive outcomes in about three quarters of the MPAs that we had data for. And uh, finally, linking together the governance and the outcomes, some of the uh, preliminary analyses that, that weren't presented here did indeed show that those with higher governance scores had greater response values in addition to the devolution of management and the regulation. And finally, uh, one of the, uh, the big <laughs> take homes, we initially, when we started uh, planning for this working group, probably more than two years ago, or maybe even three by the time we were writing the proposal, anyway, time marches on, we had uh, wanted to look at social outcomes as well. Uh, but we weren't able to do so due to the lack of data, in particular baseline social data. So this is uh, a critical knowledge gap for the, the global conservation community concerned with MPA management. If we're not collecting data on social outcomes, we can't know if the data are providing tangible benefits to local communities. Uh, and given the reliance on marine resources, it's imperative that we do have a better understanding of the social outcomes of MPAs and the relationship with governance. Uh, and I know, again, thanks to NOAA's leadership, we do have the, the SOCMON um, uh, monitoring protocol, but as with how is your MPA doing, one of the things we don't have is a framework for collecting and sharing that data so that we can actually look at it. Um, and Peter Edwards actually came to our first working group and talked about that. So uh, moving forward with uh, what we hope that this research, when completed, will provide, uh, we're hoping it will look at, uh, help give us continued insights into how we govern MPAs and help improve MPA success on the ground. Uh, and we also hope that by uh, first demonstrating the value of monitoring and evaluation of the governance and management conditions and of the social and ecological impacts of conservation interventions, and then providing, you know, in addition, providing an interdisciplinary framework to address these gaps in existing knowledge, that this then will lead to increased coordination and use of the data that can help fill the gap between monitoring uh, and information for action, including those gaps in social data collection that I mentioned, and help make significant progress in designing and implementing interventions that are successful in conserving threatened marine biodiversity and in improving uh, social well-being of those that depend on the resources. So with that, uh, we're happy to take any questions and thank you very much for, uh, for your attention and for hosting us in this webinar. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, uh, both Helen and David. That was a really great presentation, lots of interesting uh, food for thought. Um, I will say one of the first questions was, is it possible to get a copy of the presentation available after the webinar? Uh, we do plan to post a recording of the webinar, and Helen, if I'm right, you're going to share a, um, a version of the slides uh, that, uh, with, with information that uh, you're comfortable sharing, given that this is preliminary. Is that right? Yeah. That's exactly right. So we will get that. It's just that, you know, as I hope you got a sense of, this is just sort of coming together to a point where we can do analyses, and it may well change, especially if we're able to add a few numbers. So we would not want um, to have inaccurate information, <laughs> but we're, you know, we're confident in what we've done now. But we are still working on it. Great. And I wanted to ask, and I think so, a couple of others were interested in this area about the term devolution and what exactly uh, is included in that. Okay, um, for devolution, we're looking at the, um, the transfer of managing authority from a state to a non-state actor. And this is opposed to looking at decentralization, which is um, from a larger scale down to the local scale. And so um, we were initially wanted to look at both, but it, it is quite difficult um, in looking at, say, de um, decentralization where the national scale on some islands may actually be smaller than the local, um, the area that a local authority has to manage in a larger country. And so um, for this research, we're going to focus on, um, because there has been a lot of work um, looking at um, where, um, the where power is transferred to a non-state actor, um, those see different outcomes than those that are in cases where the intervention is managed by the state. 
So one of the questions that was raised is, can you conclude from this that uh, MPAs are more successful if they have a bottom-up approach? Uh, uh, from the results so far, it does seem um, that those that um, were not managed, uh, more of those that were not managed by the state were successful. Again, the bottom-up pro bottom approach indicates um, the scale of management, and so we're still working to see if we can look at look at that. Um, but not to say that the states are doing everything wrong. <laughs> uh, but so far, it does show that um, having either a non-state or a shared uh, relation, uh, shared management between state and non-state, which in some literature has shown that that is much stronger than either state or non-state. Um, those MPAs, uh, on average, had a greater, had more positive outcomes. Okay, thank you. Uh, there was also a question about how stakeholder involvement was defined and measured. Uh, yeah, so in the assessment, um, the question relates to um, local communities and so our stakeholders. So. What are, do they directly contribute to decision making within the MPA? And so this is done on a scale, um, or on an ordinal scale, ranging from local stakeholders have no involvement in uh, decision making all the way to they are fully involved within and contribute to decisions that are made within the marine protected area. Okay, and uh, there's a question uh, asking. Um, getting more toward the biological side, um, how do you differentiate good outcomes such as increases in biomass across functional groups um, from those that are less good, for example, um, invasive species increases or biomass increases in one trophic level that could cause an imbalance? Um, yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, with the scale of the analysis that we're doing right now, it's um, difficult to get down into the into functional groups um, and invasive species at this stage. Um, however, that is something that we're going to be looking at in um, in the in the next round of analyses, um, looking at um, fun, uh, digging deeper into the um, functional things like functional diversity, um, predator biomass, etc., and so taking a deeper look within the community structure. To, um, to isolate some, some of those impacts as well. And uh, George Leonard also had a question about um, responses and asked, why would you see negative responses as opposed to no response? Does that suggest that poorly designed or enforced MPAs actually attract more fishing and extraction than if they weren't established at all? Um, that's a, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, it, again, um, this is, dealing with MPAs at a global scale and so they were, they could be in that case, yes, um, where MPAs could be attracting more effort or it could be um, a poorly situated MPA to begin with. Um, and so it is very hard to dis disentangle some of those effects but um, in, in any case, um, for the majority, I can say that for the majority of the MPAs, one of the main objectives is to protect the biodiversity within its boundaries. And so, if the, if the MPA is failing to do that relative to the outside, um, to the conditions outside of the MPA, then that MPA definitely is underperforming. And there's another question from Marcy Cockrell about the ones that scored negatively on the response ratios and wondered if there was a um, a time component involved, did older MPAs have a more positive response than those that were established more recently? Um, yeah, I, in the preliminary results, I did not see um, a strong effect of time as much as size. Um, there was definitely a size effect. Um, and for an, our analysis, what we did to ensure that we gave the NPA time to actually, the, for the fish to actually have a response protection, uh, we only looked at MPAs that were established um, for at least three years, so that at least gave some time for the um, for a response to happen to be be able to be detected. But um, so far, with the preliminary results, um, age does, we do not see as strong as effect with age as we do uh, for size. Okay. 
And what do you see for size? Uh, <laughs> yes, for size, it's a very, it's very peculiar. Um, where it might actually be that the very small MPAs and the very large MPAs are having greater uh, have greater response of ratios or greater outcomes than those that are in between. And I suspect it has to do with small MPAs, um, a lot of small MPAs being no take, um, and then the very large MPAs um, they being placed in locations where. Um, it, uh, where fish populations are already um, in good condition. There are a couple of questions from colleagues in California, um, Cindy Dawson and Stephen Wirtz, who just commented that California has a very well-established network of marine protected areas that used a science-driven approach and uh, extensive stakeholder engagement, and wondering if those were included in this analysis. Um, unfortunately, we were not able to get uh, much um, governance data from uh, developed countries uh, other than the NOAA, the, those that were done by the NOAA um, management checklist. And that is because the majority of the locations where the, the MET, the management effectiveness tracking tool is implemented, is done in developing countries where the World Bank and the Global Environment Facility works. And so we were unable to find a comparable management or government governance assessment within developed countries such as the US, Europe, and Australia. And so those were those are some of the gaps um, that we have right now um, in terms of having the governance data. So as you look to fill some of those gaps, might it be possible for developing countries to uh, provide data that was comparable to the MET? Um, it, if they are, if they do have, um, I mean, if that data are available. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if the data are available, and if there's that sort of translation ability, right? Because that was one of the things that um, we did with the NOAA management checklist and the the management effectiveness tracking tool. Is like, if these are the variables and the indicators, and these are the questions, this is how we would score it. So yeah, so if there was some way of doing that, yeah, that would be yes, yeah, so it was very difficult to find assessments that we could ensure that we had the same construct validity across um, across the different assessment tools. And so we have to ensure that the questions match as well as the individual scores and responses to each question. They are speaking to the same thing. Uh, and so it, so far in our search, we have not been able to find is a similar assessment within the developed world. Okay, well I'm glad that you've put your um, contact information up there, so if people do have thoughts on that, uh, can they go ahead and follow up with you then? Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we appreciate that, we're certainly. And I know, again, this how is your MPA doing uh, assessment, they had governance questions as well, and I know uh, you know, many MPAs have done that through NOAA's efforts, but again, a lot of it comes to there's no system for collecting that data. So it was, it's very useful, it's been, you know, our understanding is it's proven very useful at a site level, but there wasn't a system in place to be able to aggregate that data and then compare across sites. And actually, Helen, since you raised that question, there was a question raised about, uh, from Adam Fridmog asking, did you try to look at individual MPAs versus MBAs that were part of a network? Yes, yes. Um, all of the analysis comprises of those individual as well as those that are within a network. But we didn't compare no, across no, single didn't. versus network. Yeah. Okay. I, I know that um, effective use of monitoring data was a big question, a big a point that you observed. Lou Gramer asks, um, what are the critical variables to monitor and what recommendations can you offer in terms of how to integrate information into management? Okay, that's a big question. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, so I mean, there are some. It, in terms of when you're monitoring for the effectiveness of an intervention, you have to come back to what are the objectives. And so, if the object objectives are to conserve biodiversity and that alone, then having the appropriate indicators that match that can detect for the effect of the intervention as well as other unintended impacts on the on the um, ecosystem you want to monitor for those if you um, if the intervention is to promise and it uh, promises social benefits then um, having appropriate um, social impact indicators in place 
and having a research design that allows um, for uh, isolation of the impact itself. Um, some of the work that has been done in the other parts of the MPA mystery project uh, has developed a manual for some um, for some monitoring protocols, and so it does provide a lot of the information on what are some of the key variables you want to look at, and um, those are available on the MPA mystery website uh, for if you are interested in looking at those in detail. And and I would also add one of the big components is, is the monitoring data used for management? Yeah. Uh, and I know there are, have also been guidance and folks thinking, you know, if you see this, then you should do that. And what I'm thinking of is also from California, the Ocean Sciences Trust and some of the work around actually evaluating those networks of MPAs and then providing management guidance and advice based on what you actually see from, from the monitoring. And related to the response questions, uh, Jennifer Scholl had asked, have you, were you able to consider forms of fishery management that might confound uh, some of the observations in terms of biomass inside uh, and outside MPAs? That would be great, <laughs> but uh, we're working on this analysis at the global scale and so we are unable to disentangle some of those other management interventions. And so for, but what we have done with the matching part in analysis is we ensure that uh, we only chose sites inside and outside of the MPA that were from the same um, within the national boundaries. So we did not want sort of an, a, a cross boundary or um, the differences in management policies in one country um, confounding our analysis by picking one in country A uh, versus one in country B. So we did attempt to control for um, some of the differences in, in, in national fisheries regulations by ensuring that we, we stuck with um, points inside and outside the MPA within the same natural the same boundaries. And just related to the issue about inside and outside boundaries, Catherine Wyatt asked, did your study include any measurement of benefits to an MPA to areas outside the MPA, such as spillover? Um, not as yet, and that's something I'm really anxious to <laughs> to use the data to look at, and to, because we do have uh, data from inside, just on the boundary, and um, and at sort of a, a and the distance away from the MPA. And I'm hoping, um, as when this round of analysis is finished, finish to look at a distance decay effect. If we if we see some sort of um, decay as we move away from the MPA boundaries and then look to see then how other contextual or governance factors might affect the, the spillover that might be um, be detected in the data. Because, uh, just to add, because those, any, um, in the matching, any sites that were too close to the MPA were discarded in order to provide a valid match in case there was spillover happening. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, we have a question from Angela Orthmeyer asking about the regulations indicator. Can you talk about how you decided whether or not regulations supported management of the MPA? And can you give an example of a regulation that didn't support the management goals? Well, these are um, these assessments were not um, done uh, in terms of the scoring was not done by us. These were um, assessments were completed by either the MPA manager uh, or within a focus group within um, or of stakeholders for the MPA, and so as part of the MET yeah, assessment. Yeah, as part of the MET assessment, and so it is. It is with their local knowledge, with as a manager of the MPA, uh, are the re local regulations or the national regulations that are in place? Do they provide enough support um, for the um, for the, the functioning of the MPA? And I think you know, from the WCMC website, it's possible to download the MET, the Management Assessment Effectiveness Tracking Tool, so you can actually see what are the questions that make up the MET. And so basically what we did is look at what the answers were to those specific questions and say, well, these are indicators, you know, these are the, the, the metrics yeah. for these indicators. Yeah. And so the, for that question, it did range from um, having no regulations in place or they were not well defined are uh, to uh, having those regulations that are in place uh, well supported of the MPA um, policies. Okay. Um, Erica Cunningham asked, are there 
regional bright spots or bright spots in terms of countries that could be helpful in terms of models for good MPA governance that other countries could rep replicate when they're looking at policy reforms? Yeah. Um, I haven't looked to add a um, specific, um, I haven't looked to downscale to try to identify those regions as yet. Um, we are, however, um, we do have some very strong data sets from specific parts of the world, um, specifically the Caribbean and some areas in Indonesia. So we can then sort to yeah, look at areas where we do see well-performing MPAs and then look to see in terms of governance. Um, again, um, in, and in the different contexts, so are there bright spots in in nearshore MPAs? Those MPAs where there's like you have strong um, anthropogenic stressors. Uh, do we see certain aspects of governance within those MPAs that uh, um, within MPAs with, with positive response ratios with um, with high um, outcomes under those stressful conditions? And so, hopefully, uh, with Further on in the analysis, we will be able to look at um, look at that in context. And I, I suspect this is probably in a future iteration. But a, a similar question: Was it a, were you able to parse out the strength of state government structures and how that affected the outcomes of MPAs? Uh, well, other than the available data within the assessments, uh, we were not able to determine. What, um, the uh, other factors of, uh, regarding the strength of the, the state manage the of the state and how they manage. Uh, we we just have to rely on the available data. But we but it is in something that we can look at to see of those M MPAs that are managed by the state. Uh, what aspects of governance do we see? Our governance structures in place are in those that are performing better than others. And so it could be likely that some state MPAs uh, require um, strong, for example, inclusive decision-making arrangements for them to be more successful than others. And so, yes, in future iterations and being able to we hope to dig down into some of those details. Just an observation, I think many people uh, understand the importance of community engagement and buy-in in MPA management and governance. Uh, but also, I think, especially those of us in North America would see the advantage in state-managed MPAs in terms of having resources to bring to the table. Um, and I realize this is kind of calling on you to interpret the data, but is there any um, indication of kind of the, um, the benefits in ter of, of state-managed MPAs in terms of bringing resources for, for example, regulation and monitoring? Yeah. Um... Well, it's difficult to do at this stage with the data, but from the literature, um, having actually the combination of the resources and the, the capacity at the, the state from the state, linking that with um, local or non-state actors who um, may be more aware of the, the conditions and, and, uh, and aware of what would work under various contexts than the state, than the state alone, having that sort of shared arrangement may actually be stronger. Um, that's something that I'm hoping to look at in the data, but it is um, some have found in looking at case studies that having that shared um, a sh a combination of the capacity and the resources at the high level, as well as the local knowledge um, that is brought from non-state actors or, or potentially local actors, the combination of the two actually provide a more robust um, management or governance system. I have a couple of questions from Susan Evans related to climate change and sort of changes in spatial distribution of habitat and species, and asking if uh, you were able to look at that at all in this analysis or had plans to look at that in the future. Um, at this stage, we were unable to um, to look at climate change, and a lot of these data are, are um, snapshots of conditions at the individual sites, so we, we didn't have much time series to be able to look at. Um, change uh, some of the temporal patterns that we that from the past or that we could project into the future and as it relates to climate change. Other than um, again um, having MPAs as a structure that improves the resilience of marine ecosystems from stressors such as climate change. I wonder if would um, 
Sarah Whitney's data at ZSL, the Zoological Society of London, which does have species data, which we didn't use, but I wonder if that might be, I don't know if you... Well, yeah, um, currently um, there is efforts to compile what's called the um, the LPI or the Living Planet Index, which is composed of population time series uh, from around the world. And we were initially going to use the look at using these time series to give us that, that temporal component for our analysis. However, there were very few marine populations within that database. But it's an ongoing effort um, by um, Zoological Society of London and others. And so hopefully in the future we um, then we can include some of those um, some of those data or time series data into our analyses. We do have a couple of questions just asking about future publications and access to the methodology in terms of making your work uh, more available to the to others. Yeah, yeah, I definitely know. a goal. That's <laughs> 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 David's yeah. job for the next uh, six months, right? Yes, yeah, definitely. We will um, aim to publish as. Um, publish the methodologies. One of the things that we're working to bring out first within the group is uh, the concept, sort of um, providing information on the conceptual framework behind this analysis. So how we exactly we bring in the Austrian socio-ecological um, system framework with coupling it with impact evaluation and common pool resource theory. Uh, we're hoping to get that out very soon, but um, all the results and, and the methods that we're doing, we want to publish and as much as possible hope to publish it open access. Great. Um, and another question is, do you expect the project to lead to the development of minimum data standards for monitoring or other best practices uh, for MPAs? So ideally, yes. One of the things that is a related effort uh, is, and there was in fact another sort of um, preliminary working group at SUSINC is indeed just around that, uh, what are potential ways that different data sets could talk to each other. And uh, uh, WCS, the Wildlife Conservation Society, they have a project, um, Emily Darling, who's in our working group, is leading that. And it is funded to look at, uh, in a few key coral reef geographies, what are, you know, is there scope to get to a minimum set of, of indicators? So efforts are ongoing that we do see that as the, that would be a, a helpful next step uh, from, from this work. And indeed, uh, some of the work that's, uh, that we're involved with in Indonesia is also trying to, you know, has put together basically a, a collaborative database that's in development uh, that will hopefully then be online and widely available if you know, and we can see that as potentially very useful as a way of helping managers on the ground sort of organize and store and analyze their data. So that is, again, ongoing work, but, but something that we do hope to, to, to be part of this. And I've got a question from Tundi Agardi asking, in future analyses, would you consider matching outcomes to anticipated outcomes in terms of management objectives, recognizing that all, not all MPAs are established for conservation purposes? Um, yeah, that would be, um, yes, that is the ideal scenario where, um, where you do, uh, where you have information on the actual outcomes um, related to the specific objectives of each of the protected areas. And again, at, at this scale, we were unable to pull apart the objectives of each MPA, which sometimes are um, not clearly stated um, or may not be stated at all. Um, but so, and so when we are able, and hopefully in the future, whether it be us or others, um, can compile inf other information other than ecological outcomes, um, so getting data on some of the social impacts of inf interventions such as MPAs, then we can measure the start to measure the outcomes against the stated objectives of the specific, of the NPA. Uh, I know you mentioned that you're going to be looking at uh, the uh, NPAs in different contexts, and a couple of the questions relate to that. Um, one from Catherine Lee asks, uh, "Do you think that this kind of approach could be used to evaluate types of management measures? For example, how do MPAs compare to fishing gear limits or time area closures?" I think this gets at, you know, is the MPA the right tool for the job and whether this analysis can shed some light on that question. Yeah, definitely. Um, 
and the, the framework for this analysis is set up to uh, look at any uh, look at the conservation intervention, um, whether it be fisheries, whether it be quotas, whether um, it be an MPA. And so it's only because there are available data for our MPAs that we focus on MPA in this analysis. But um, the framework that we hope to share and others will use, um, this could be used for any other or any other conservation intervention. And a related question was uh, asking, have, are you able to make any distinctions in terms of MPA success in terms of isolated sites and sites that are closer to the coast that may have more extensive uses? Yeah, okay. Um, not as yet. Um, I haven't looked at those, um, the, again, those contextual factors. I'm hoping with um, the next round of pulling in a few more MPAs that we'd be able to get a little bit more data to then look at those fat, look at the governance in different contexts, uh, near shore, offshore, large, small, um, uh, yeah. Um, there's a question from Don Zelanzi asking about what are the, some of the typical governance weaknesses that you were finding? And I know you summarized that in, the, um, in that interesting graphic that you created with the different data shown on the um, kind of the spider web approach. But I wonder if you could just comment a little bit more on what you have found in terms of the governance uh, factors. Yeah, um, in terms of the ones where we saw major weaknesses, uh, it was uh, where around 20, I believe it was 20% of the MPAs have the regulations that are in place defined, um, set up, regulations are set up to support management. Um, that was one of the weaknesses as well. Because that means 80% don't, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, and um, I think I, if I, off the top of my head, I think it was 27 or 29% had clearly defined boundaries. So in coming back to the theory, um, that's where the resource users actually know the rules and regulations in place um, for the, um, the intervention and for the MPA. And then the one by far, the one with the lowest percentage was those MPAs that collect monitoring data. And there are, I'm sure, millions of dollars spent around the world collecting monitoring data, but only around 16% say that monitoring data feeds back into management. And so closing that, the, that loop in terms of going out there and actually measuring what the impact of your intervention and using that to make real-time decisions is, some, is an area of, um, that needs, definitely is in need of improvement. We also have a question from Laura Iwaniki asking about the fisheries-related outcomes. Are you also planning to look at benthic data as an outcome, or is fisheries meant to be sort of an inclusive term? Um, for now, um, we are using biomass, but we do have some data on, for example, in areas where it's we're on um, the data are looking at coral reefs, we do have some coral cover data, as well as other fisheries, um, community metrics, richness, um, size, mean size, etc. Um, for now, we're focusing on biomass, but it, it is something that we hope to look at in the future to see what are the, in, the impacts of MPAs on um, benthic um, reef health. Right, and I will note we have to wrap up here in just a moment. We do have a few questions we didn't get to, some of them quite specific suggestions about methodology, and I just wanted to mention that the speakers will get copies of all the questions, so they may be able to follow up individually with folks who had some very specific comments. And I just wanted to note that um, we did get some thank yous from various folks uh, to our speakers. I think this was a terrific, a very broad look at MPA effectiveness on a global scale, something we often don't get to, to step back and take a look at that. And also in terms of the examining the linkages between governance and uh, biological outcomes. So really thank you both for, uh, for your time and for this great project and for taking the time to come and speak with us. 
Well, thank you very much, and we certainly want to make it very clear this is a, <laughs> a collective effort. It was a big working group with, uh, you know, again, our co-PIs, Mike Masha and Bob Pomeroy, and support from Sysink and Luke Hoffman and, and everybody else in the working group. So uh, we very much appreciate all of that and are glad that we're able to, to share it with you all. Yes, and, and as well as a thank you to all of our data providers, because without them, <laughs> we would have no data to look, to, to look at. And so, yeah, um, thank you. Thank you to you all. All right, and I also want to add my thanks to Susie Holst for, for Noah's contribution to this effort, and also wanted to remind folks that the recording of this webinar will be available on open channels for anyone who didn't get a chance to hear the whole thing. Um, thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.